So there's Dar. Say hi, guys. Hi, guys. Hello. What's going on? You know, just uh, straight chilling over here. Day five of isolation in Brooklyn. So. Oh yeah, not right. A lot. So why don't you uh, why don't you kind of explain how that's going? Sure. So uh, I live in a petri dish now that we call New York City. Um, the, so a few days ago, we thought that I had had some kind of exposure because I got a sore throat and I had a fever and like the worst headache you've ever had. But I'm glad to say that it turns out that instead I was just exposed to something I'm aggressively allergic to by a gym that I was renting space in. So I work as a coach, but I do a lot of in-person movement rehab for people who have had a uh, chronic illness or some kind of life affecting injury. And in a weird puppet theater demonstration of all these gyms trying to keep open, this one gym owner was just spraying everything that anybody touched. He was wiping down immediately and he had made his own disinfectant with citronella in it, which is not a disinfectant. And I'm allergic to citronella. And when I breathe it in, my throat gets just cheeseburgery. Um, so I was sick for a couple of days because of that. I don't think I have Corona. We can't, we don't know. There's not enough tests in New York city. So I don't know for sure, but I haven't had any of the other symptoms for days and days. So I isolated myself to keep everyone else safe. Um, which has been a weird experiment of me hanging out with cats a lot. Um, but nah, I feel much better. Um, nice. a, a little, little tum trouble, but I think that's just from stress, honestly. Um, and I'm okay. I don't think I have coronavirus now, um, but I do know some people who do, and they're like locked in their apartments, feeling gross. So that sucks. It does suck. I mean, but, not that like at least they're smart enough to keep themselves kind of locked away. Well, I'm of the mind that like I hope that anybody who is upstate that would get exposed would protect our grandmother. So I'm gonna protect everyone else's bubby. And if I think I'm sick, I'm not going out. Yeah, don't bring don't bring the Rona home and kill me, Ma, you dicks. All right. Yeah. Seriously. No one no um, one wants that. Pragmatic optimism and compassionate empathy, right? Like care about what other people are going through. Don't be a dick. Uh, but also don't unreasonably freak out. And don't hoard the fucking TP, you jerks. Yeah. So yeah, shall we? Do you want me to like set up what they're about to watch? What do they know about this already? So nothing. I I would not share with them. Like like they know that it's about wellness, um, and it's about like loving yourself, uh, so that with the intention of loving others, right? I mean, immediately I thought of. Loving yourself, but yes. Loving um, yourself. Loving yourself. So this, I'm a, currently a master's candidate at the University of Pennsylvania. The program is Applied Positive Psychology, which I explain what that is in the talk. Um, very recently, I was asked to give their version of a TED Talk, which is Ben Talk, because Ben Franklin founded the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and this is basically, essentially the foundations of my master's thesis. This is my... Like, can you talk about technical things to a non-technical audience? And I know that Dan was kind enough to ask all of you to vote for me, even though it turns out you couldn't see my talk. Uh, so They voted anyway because I gave away a $140 copy of a video game. Oh, I didn't know that you did that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that was the reward. Show up, vote, and brother. I'll give you cool shit. That was, Aww, yeah. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, well, anyway, thanks for the people who made the effort to do that. So uh, we thought it would be nice to come on to play it. Now you can actually see what you were voting for. Um, I did win. I also won my category, which was rewarding in a way I didn't expect because, you know, <laughs> who am I to give an academic talk? Um, and yeah, he bribed you. I know. Yay, bribery. But now you're being bribed by lear maybe learning some things about yourself. I don't know. Um, so we're going to play the talk. I'm going to share my thoughts on it and answer any questions you have about wellness and fitness and well-being and taking good care of yourself and why that matters and why we should have purpose. And I know it's so scary, but I believe in you, Mick. I believe in you. It's going to be okay. Don't don't talk to Sheltsy. He's a douchebag. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I kind of expect that anyone who's spending time watching you on the internet is auto default to D-bag. But, um, yeah, pretty much. So so, all right, and just so that we're gonna we're gonna set ground rules, kids. Okay, 
So uh, attempt a collegiate at least level of humor. No like <laughs> no like junior high bullshit, please and thank you. Save the junior high bullshit for another point in time. We're gonna try and be somewhat adult here. Please, please and thank you. Please, please, please. All right. Okay. Does so, that mean that I can't have junior high humor? Because I've got a whole stack of fart jokes ready to go. Well, uh, another day. <laughs> another day. I'm just joking. I'm so, just joking. So um, let's, uh, let's just go start with why don't, why don't you explain to people uh, what it is that uh, you are, I guess, striving toward? With your you, with your profession and your education, like what is it oh, that like you're what I'm about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what what you about? So I believe very strongly that uh, my kind of purpose in life, what I'm here to do on this earth, and I think all of us have our own interpretations, and there's lots of people who don't know. But for me, my purpose is inspiring other people to take good care of themselves, so that they can build skills and resources and uh, you know, a successful, happy life, a flourishing life, and then contribute whatever their purpose is. So that's like what I'm about. I believe I was put on this earth to be a conduit to help other people like figure their shit out. And sometimes that's helping them learn how to move in a way that's low pain and function. And that's why I do my, my in-person sessions are typically with people who have chronic illness or catastrophic injury. Um, I should say life affecting injury. Sometimes they're not that like overwhelming. Um, and sometimes that is just coaching with people on their personal resiliency, their you know, the bullshit that's going on inside of their heads, how they communicate with other people, finding purpose, finding meaning. Um, so my writing, my talks, my workshops are all in different domains along those foundations. Um, there's not really a name for that profession, which is why I go with coach, because it's a lot of how do I communicate information in a way that is meaningful to others. But that's really what I'm about. So that started with me um, having to figure out a lot of stuff for myself in my early twenties, when I was diagnosed with a chronic illness and I was treating my body like a rental car, that's what led me to become a trainer specializing in people who have stuff. And it was the effort. I talk about this in the talk. It was going out to figure out like, well, how do I, if, if ever, underneath all of the behaviors of my clients are the lens that they see the world through and their beliefs and their psychology and their, um, their way of approaching their philosophy of their life. Well, I need to understand how all that works if I'm going to really meaningfully help people and not just like get them to go to the gym sometimes. And that's how I got into positive psychology. Uh, I felt quite honored to get into this program because it is like the premier program in the world for what I'm studying. And yeah, the intention is to be the carrier pigeon for that to the world. It's like, if I can get anybody to just give a fuck about themselves in any meaning. I'm not, I can say fuck, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah no. <laughs> um, to give a fuck about themselves in a meaningful way, well, then you're that much better to do the thing that you do and that you're good at, and you're going to help that many more people with what they do and what they're good at. And then we have this ripple effect of, like, giving a fuck about each other. Um, yeah. There you go. That's, that's, what you, that's, what, that's, that's what everybody should do, right? Yeah. And to answer in chat, yes, this is cispeg. Is that yeah. what we're going with? Are we going with? I thought we were going with metapeg. Metapeg. So this is this is my sister. Yes, Coach Coach Darlene Coach Dar is my is my sister. Yes. And uh, and you couldn't she's, tell by the way that we're basically. I like that the way we're framed in the the. I don't know what you call it, the scene. Yes. Is that we're kind of like mirror images of each other? Yeah. Yeah. Visually. Yeah. Like just if we do face swap and he's shaved, it's yeah. the same face. Yeah, we're the same person. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm cooler than you. Oh yeah. Yeah, in every in every aspect. Yeah. I'm cooler than you in person. You're cooler than me on the internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in person I'm not that cool. That's very very true. <laughs> Dan, I describe Dan to my friends as my sibling that's easy to kill. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Of the three of us, of the three of us, because we all we also have a brother. Of the three of us, I I am the easiest one to kill. Well, do you remember if we the think, first if we time think about you read, it? The first time you read um, Dark Tower, and you came to me, and you were like, "I want to be a gunslinger," and I made a weird face, and you were like, "Oh, you're the gunslinger," and I I'm just I said that you were the gunslinger. Digitally. I said that you were the gunslinger, and I was uh I was that one dude that like uh 
had like the I never had a drug habit, but like had like the addictive yes. personality and like bitched all the time. Like that was yes. me. Yeah. 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 Um, you have a brother. Okay. He does come around. We do have a brother who's. So the there's a romance. there's a running joke that another streamer uh, named Veritas that's a really really good friend of mine. Uh, if you saw a picture of him, he looks very very similar to us. But oh, he's cool. but he's like five foot six and ninety pounds, and he's he's a he's a weasel faced douchebag nothing. And I'm, Which I'm, is I'm waiting. So he can't. I'm waiting for I'm waiting for somebody to clip that I just said that and and send it to him, so that so that he can see it. You know. But it also means that he couldn't possibly be one of us because do they know we're giants? Yeah. So well, the running joke is because we look so similar, like in the face that I said that he was my brother. He's eight years younger than me. You know, and it and it, and it uh, like the meme uh, caught uh, a lot actually, and uh, to the point where like bigger streamers thought that it was true and were telling their audiences that he was my younger brother. <laughs> like it went on for like six months. It was crazy. So that's why there's there's still like all of this jokey jokes about it. So um, I think in addition to the um, poll we do about who has a cuter pet, Bruce or Arnie, we should also do the poll of whether or not people want to bet on if we're twins. Yeah, yeah, that that was another thing we used to do, guys. We used to tell people that we were twins, and uh, and people would buy it. Like, because I mean, we, we look, <laughs> we look super similar. So, no way, Peg is taller than five foot twins. five. So, so Coach Dar is is six one, and I'm six four, and and I, our I'm six. You're six. All right, so she's yeah. six feet. I'm six four, and and our brother, my my younger brother, is six six, give or take. Yeah. He's a giant. Yeah. Um, he a big boy. Person, he's a big boy. I, I don't I realize that you might not know this yet because you haven't met him yet, but man person is only five six. Oh, your boyfriend is five six? <laughs> yeah. He's, mm. I like to kiss him on top of the head. <laughs> <laughs> that is so so fucking great. Oh my god, that's great. He's great. That's great. I love that. That's yeah, so funny. He, uh, I cannot tell you how many times uh, people in the streets of New York have yelled out to me, I want to climb that tree. And in my in the back of my head, I sometimes am like, I know someone who likes to climb this tree. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, you are, you are you are you're Taylor. He likes that I kiss him on top of the head. You're tailor oh, made. Oh, you're tailor made for Twitch. You need to have your own channel. I'm convinced. You can just have me on. It's a lot of, it, it seems like it's a lot of work that I don't really know how to do. So you can you just is, have me on. It is. Uh, if you ask, if you ask anyone in my chat, it's not a real job. I don't really work for a living because that's the meme, but it's, it's a lot of fucking People work. think that as a trainer, I just stand around in my sub suit and like hang out with people all the time. I, I didn't stream yesterday because I was editing a, a YouTube video that I finally got uploaded last night at 1am. Uh, it took me 13 hours. And I had to beg, I had to, so our mom came to visit, my, our mom and, and our stepdad came to visit yesterday. Uh, they were here uh, yesterday and this morning, and I didn't really get to see them yesterday because I was basically just shut in the office, and I, like, basically begged mom to come back and that I would cook her breakfast this morning before they left because, like, I didn't get to see them, you know, so. Um, but anyway, I, no. so. Um, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. I'll just come bother you. She'd steal your viewer base? Your That's fine. That's fine. Somebody should fucking take you guys. I mean, if they want to hang out with me, I don't my want Instagram you. is at darlene.coach. Yeah. At, at darlene.coach on Instagram, kiddos. And uh and there's a website. So as we as we kind of progress through this, I'll show you guys the website too. But the uh the the command in chat is exclamation point coach dar. It will take you to uh, a website that she actually created for our community. Um, that has uh, some some coaching related stuff that you guys can check out, and uh, if you would like some more uh, personalized stuff from her, um, of which uh, I know that she has some extremely limited capacity because she's only one person and can only do so much, um, you guys can uh, can take advantage of that if you so choose. Okay. So anyway, um, we're going to we're going to play this uh, video of her talk um, at um, at uh, the School of Applied. Uh, positive psychology, right? Yeah, so at University of Pennsylvania's Master's in Applied Positive Psychology. Right, University of Pennsylvania, which was begun by Ben Franklin, which is why this is the Ben talk and not a TED talk, correct? Bingo, Okay, yep. all right. So um, we are going to uh, watch her talk, the award-winning talk, as, as, it, as it turns out, and, uh, and we'll, we'll see what you guys think, okay? All right, here we go. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
My name is Darlene Marshall, and at some point, you have probably been told that you were being selfish. And hopefully you did a few things in your life that were selfless, and it's pretty likely that once or twice you've done some things that made you think less of yourself. But what's the self that we're talking about here? Well, Baumeister defines it as the individual's belief about him or herself, including the person's attributes and who and what the self is, which is a lot to wrap your head around. Yourself is your internal idea of who you think you are. And culturally, we're taught to think of the self as a static set of characteristics, that we are fun and funny, or we're a downer. We're committed, we're gritty, we're determined. You're tough and resilient, or you're kind of lazy. And even though we think of these things as set characteristics, many of us still make efforts at self-improvement. And because of that, the self-improvement industry is projected to gross $13.2 billion in 2022. The first few decades of that industry's hallmarks were a pseudo-spiritual practices, wild claims, and aggressive marketing tactics, but they worked because people really want to feel good about themselves. In contrast, positive psychology has been a 30-year wave of scientific rigor of what it means to live a good life, the practices that help us get there, and about how to apply it in people's lives so that they really learn it. Sometimes that change is externally motivated. We want to change to please other people or because we don't feel good enough. And often, those changes cause someone to resent their efforts, however long they've lasted. You can reject the role involved, and then oftentimes people will seek out something that feels true to them. In contrast, internal changes, the things we want to do, help build self-related skills so that we feel good about ourselves. Those intrinsically motivated changes help us to build our positive belief, efficacy, our autonomy, our self-regulation, and our sense of our own worth. My thesis is that these improvements are not only related to the domain involved, but because of their self-related improvements, they facilitate change in other domains. And then those can baby step and compound, facilitating someone taking on greater and greater challenges. Fitness improvements can lead to improved self-regulation and diet changes. These compound to improve someone's confidence. Those collaboratively allow better relationships and improve career prospects, increasing overall life satisfaction, and all of these domains have the potential to cycle back on themselves. Further, we're taught to think about self-improvement as merely self-serving, that you can lose 10 pounds in 10 days, you can make a million dollars, you can live on the beach, but if it's just self-serving, it doesn't actually lead to long-term happiness and satisfaction. I believe that truly successful self-improvement is so that we can contribute to our families, our communities, and the broader world. We know from Isaac Prilaltensky's work on mattering that there is a significant subjective well-being increase when we feel we're contributing to the things that are important to us. I contend that self-improvement is the act of building up something worth giving away. And in my eight years in the fitness industry, I've focused working with people who suffer from chronic illness or have had life-affecting injuries. Those people have come to me primarily for movement, but over time we see a cascading effect through their lives, some of which I'd like to share with you. First, a woman who suffers from chronic Lyme's disease, but is the primary caregiver to two other critically ill adults. She came to realize that any time that she was taking to take care of herself, was so that she could then care for the people that she loved, all supported by Bellini the Doodle here. <laughs> and then there's Kate Brown. She's a large-scale installation artist who realized that emboldening herself physically would allow her to better handle her projects. She, her art focuses on systemic violence, sometimes in totalitarian governments, but the violence in her work was causing her stress-related conditions. By working on herself physically, emotionally, spiritually, she was able to give voice to people who are literally being silenced by their world. Or take an avid angler whose gout and joint pain was keeping him from the river, but by gaining physical resiliency, it not only got him back to his hobby, but he's also an environmental conservationist who worked to protect the waterways between New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and my great home state of New York. And if you know any fishermen, you know I had to sign in blood to get this picture and not tell you where it is. <laughs> and then one of my all-time favorites, full disclosure, she was not my client. But at 86, a woman who is housebound, sedentary, obese, and cannot walk without an aid, loses her life partner 
and realizes that if she's gonna keep on living, she has to live differently. And over many years, I watched her consistent efforts to get better, and at 92, I saw a miracle, her walk across the room completely unassisted. This was her favorite of my t-shirts, and illustrates how delightful of a human being she was. She was warm and kind and funny, and she was our proof. It is never too late for you to start, you always have something to give. For her, it was her very presence in a room. But lest you think that I am just a student or only a practitioner, I personally am a benefactor of this process. This is a very different Darlene. At 23, I was a comedic actor, but my persona offstage was basically the opposite of this. I was smoking and drinking. I ate mostly processed and fast food. I was depressed, that tortured actor, but very few people knew I was also self-harming because my self-projection was so low. Not long after this picture was taken, I was diagnosed with a chronic illness myself, and my prognosis was poor, but I wanted to get better, so I started with just the baby steps, little things that I could change to get better, and over time, they compounded. I could take on bigger and bigger challenges. And over years, I came to a place where I was ready to leave the entertainment industry and become something I never thought I'd be, which was a personal trainer. That Darlene didn't believe in this one. <laughs> I grew that into being a sought-after coach. But then I wanted more to give my clients, and that's how I discovered positive psychology. It is through that compounding effect that I became this Darlene, someone who never thought Oops, too many. <laughs> Someone who never thought that she could study at a prestigious institution, really learn these things, but even she had growing to do that she didn't understand yet. And through that process of being willing to change, I made it here, sharing my ideas with all of you and out to the world. But that's because building yourself isn't about making only yourself feel good. It's about starting where you are, about consistent change over time that allows you to grow sustaining those efforts so that they can compound and you can transform so that you can contribute to everyone around you the very best of yourself. Thank you. So there you go, guys. Words with my mouth. Yeah. I don't know, Dan. What do you think? <laughs> I thought the talk was awesome. Because, Thank you. Because... Um, you know, when we were when we were growing up, um, I was never like super privy to all that stuff as it was going on. But looking back, uh, you know, you could recognize like, oh yeah, I remember that time, you know, and uh, and it speaks a lot to stuff that I'm sure a lot of people like in the chat and all that stuff can relate to, like trying to once you kind of become like self aware and you start kind of working through those things or trying to. Um, you know, not, not really being able to like put a name on it. You just kind of know like something's up. And then uh, the difference being in your case, like you really grabbed onto it and, and, uh, we're like, yeah, I'm not going to let this thing kick my ass. And, uh, you know, you've been working on overcoming every little hurdle that comes your way ever since. And it's, it's really cool. Thanks. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a weird thing to have it be your sibling saying those things while also other people are listening. Um, so like one, like, yes, thank, thank you for recognizing. And you, I think have been one of the people in my life that going through it, you know, it kind of pushed us apart from each other. And in the last few years, we both have really made an effort to come back around the other side. So yeah. I think for people who watch us now, they're like, Oh, they've always been tight. Uh, that hasn't been true. And it has been a process. <laughs> Not at all. Um, but I think that, you know, to, to what you're saying about me and mine. So after I gave the talk and it was in an academic setting, like that's what you don't necessarily pick up in the context of is I'm talk, you know, I'm, I'm delivering the speech to a room of random people who've come having no idea who's streaming, but the judges are all professors. The people who actually gave me the awards at the end of the day were the heads of like this world renowned institutions, professional school handing me like a certificate with my name on it and a check and it's and and then coming up later and saying like oh you know you, you were very passionate and very vulnerable and that for me it's like what did my 19 year old self need to hear to not end up in the dark place that my 23 year old self was in 
And I didn't know that I could get better. I just knew I couldn't stay like I was. And, and it was an extreme case and I was being diagnosed with this thing that I was told, you're going to live on your couch. You're only going to get worse. Nobody gets better from this. Um, that it was like my turn to get like sedentary and fat and just be in pain all the time. And it felt like a death sentence because I was a collegiate rugby player, right? Like I was a varsity athlete for five years and now it's like, nope, you're not that person anymore. Um, right. And I just couldn't swallow that. Right. It wasn't an option. Um, so I didn't know if I could get better, but I was damned if I wasn't going to try. <laughs> and so for me, people who hear it, like they hear the theory, but you have to also hear that I'm not just some academic being like, well, this is how I think change works. Like we know how change works, but it doesn't work at all if you don't know that you can, that it's possible. Right. And the only way you know it's possible is if you look at p other people and see like, yeah, that person used to be in this bad place and now they're in a better place. Oh, I guess it's possible. And then you yeah. try. Yeah. And it's, and that kind of like hits the, uh, hits on the, uh, the, the idea that, um, you know, if you try to put it in any other context, like it would make sense. But because you're talking about like people's mentition or like how they approach like certain subjects, they they're just like, oh, burr, burr. you know, like it's like, OK, yeah, uh, what I want you to do is go rebuild that engine over there. And you've never even held a hammer before and don't know what a screwdriver looks like. And you're like, you got to be insane. And, and then you're like, well, you know, like, why don't you try doing these things? And it's like, well, that's not how my brain works. And you know what I mean? And yeah. and people think that so either people are like so um, uh, like lo they look at it like such a daunting task that they don't want to undertake it in the first place because it's such a like a hurdle to try and get over or even start. And then other people are like, well, that's just the way things are because I'm set in my ways and I want to be Jake. <laughs> well, and that's where the, the self concept comes in, right? Like, right. Oh, I am these things. I am loud and obnoxious and too much for everyone to handle. Like I'm using myself right now. Like I overwhelm everyone around me. I don't have enough self-control. I am dramatic. Well, those are all adjectives that are situational specific that can be worked on. They're all skills and behaviors and beliefs. Right. And if you don't know that, like that's the, the start of the talk, right? Like we think of ourselves as like really set, but we want to feel good and we want to change. So how do you do that in a way that's sustainable? And to, to rum rum in the chat, like it's easy to be like, okay, I'm going to do these two or three things and then I'm going to be good. I'm going to be done. And it's like, well, no, there's always a next, just like in any game that's built well, right? Like there's always a next level. There's always a patch that comes out. And if you think about it as yourself of like, okay, what's the next patch? You can keep playing the game of how, how far can I go with this? That's instead actually, of it, that's a really good amount, analogy, actually. I like metaphor. You yeah. know, I like metaphor. Yeah. It's my favorite Woo! theory device. No, I, 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 like, I like the way that you think about that because, like, you know, anybody that's in here that plays video games, and most people do, I think, um, it, it, probably everybody does, uh, if you think about, like, the things in a video game that you wish that you could change because you've been, you know, playing whatever game that you've been playing for long enough to find flaws, I mean, if you think about it, you've been, you know, your own RP character your entire life, and if somebody was looking at you from the outside, there might be something that they say that they would do differently, you know? And it just a matter it like like you're basically the developer of your own IRL RP game, <laughs> so you got to kind of think about it from like that that uh, like third party sense and go like, well, you know, if I was going to modify something, what would I modify? And then and then obviously there's the you know having to take the step in the direction and and how you would go about that. So I guess I guess if I was going to ask you a question, it would be oh go ooh ask me a question, Dan. It would be like if you were going to recommend to someone. Um, like the first step toward trying to, uh, I guess, better themselves. Uh, what would you recommend someone should do uh, if they've never even attempted something like this before? Valid question. Um, and I, with my answer to your question, I'm going to give a call out to a few people in chat who have said things like, well, you don't know what I don't know and you don't know me. And you're right, I don't which is why instead of like, oh, do what this particular coach or this book, like, like everyone says, everyone externally says, I should work out. 
Well, that is when I say extrinsic motivation in the talk, that's what I'm talking about. Everyone outside says I should be like this. Don't should all over yourself. That's right. Start with what you think will help you feel better. So like for you, Dan, it was financial planning, right? Like you were like, oh, it's money. Like I can learn about money and I'll get better. So you started with the thing that you were drawn to. For me, it was movement, partly because I was in, you know, like my genetic condition affects my joints. I had to learn how to move better. But it was also that I wanted to feel like an athlete again. I wanted to feel like a badass. I could kick someone, you know, to the curb if I wanted to. That was all internally motivated. So what domain in your life do you feel like that's the thing I want to get better at? That's the thing I care about. And starting where you are with little changes that build over time, because I I don't know who it was that said um, in the chat something about the compounding effect. It was Rum Rum that said the compounding effect is what spoke to them. It's this idea that like it cycles back. But it's you have to want to do it for you and not for anybody else for it to be most effective. So to answer your question, Dan, like if you've never uh, approached this work before, how can you gain awareness of what you can work on and what do you want to work on? And to me, a big chunk of it is the awareness piece. Like if you if you can't fix what you don't know about and you don't know what you don't know, but most of us have this like little buffer bandwidth around our current behavior of like, eh, I bet my body would feel better if I didn't eat like shit. Maybe I should eat just a little bit less like shit. So just like starting where you are being super consistent because that's how you look. I, so I teach a workshop on self-care. Um, and when I, when I'm, uh, this always comes up of like the process of change always comes up and I always like to point out that the self-improvement industry has put out this idea that it's a light switch that like, I'm going to hand you the magic pill. You're going to do the, you know, the meditation and make a list. And then tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to be a different person. But that is not the way that human psychology works. And there's a very good reason. If you woke up tomorrow and your partner was a completely different person, like if you woke up and your wifey had a, just a whole different approach to life, it would create chaos and we're tribal animals, right? Like we are meant to be connected. So rapid personality change is massively disruptive in a negative way. Because if you don't know who you are and you don't know what's true for you, like think about times in your life or people you've known that had these catastrophic changes. Like I got divorced two years ago and I lit, I just didn't know who I was for about six months. So mm-hmm. It, it's really disruptive if we did have a light switch where you were suddenly someone else because it's got to be this progressive process in order to have like stable relationships and society and be a good parent. So anyone out there who's like, I've got it three weeks and you're going to be a different person, like back away slowly. You don't actually want that. It's actually really horrible. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so I think it's start where you are. Do what you know you can do 100% be consistent And then allow yourself to change and learn lessons and look to then what's the next thing? What's the next thing? And don't ever have it be like, oh, I'm just trying to get to the end game. No, it's like, how, how many iterations of this can I do? What else can I look into and allow it to trickle into the other areas of your life? That was a really long answer. I hope that it was helpful. Yeah, no, it was good. It was good. (laughs) I'm I'm sure that there were people that, that were wondering the same thing. So, um, Uh, okay, so I I have uh, I have a uh, let's see rather long winded one. Okay. So this one this one's going to remain anonymous. Okay. Um. Okay. So my depression really fucked up all my good habits, and still is making it super hard to pick up healthy habits again for the long run. I have tons of reasons why I should do those healthy things, and tons of good healthy consequences if I do them. So much more than the negative. But even though I have those reasons, and those reasons actually make me feel a lot better both mentally and physically, I can't seem to take that step and decision to actually do it. I know that I'm super scared that if I do feel better, or rather I'm sure that when I feel better, the pressure around me will increase to get a 9 to 5 job and do all the normal things, which I don't want to do and am nowhere able to handle. My psychologist has even said she doesn't ever see me to fully be able to handle a 9 to 5 normal job. 
I know for part of that, some of the pressure I put on myself because it makes me feel lazy and taking advantage of everything and everyone. What suggestions would she give to help take steps to get through that or if she has another point of view as to what may be stopping me? That's yeah, a, that's a big, a big one, right? It's a big it's a big question for a lot of reasons and I want to take time with it and tease it apart cuz I it would, I think it's really easy for someone to punt something like this and I think for your audience and what you've told me about your audience, I would not want to insult their intelligence or their real world problems by being like, oh, you just do this. <laughs> like, fuck that. Um, <clears throat> so let's just start with like, I'm not, I'm not a clinician. I'm not a psychotherapist. I'm not a psychologist. I am a health and well-being coach. So what that means is that I work with people, guiding them through a process, teaching them skills, whether those skills are around like movement or nutrition or like cognition, like problem solving. So I am not here to talk about psychological, like resolving psychological dysfunction. That's not my purview. Like I say in the talk, that's, we would say professionally, that's life below zero. Like that's trying to get from negative to neutral. And I typically try to work above zero. Um, but that being said, even working above zero, like people have real shit that happens. We all have like real problems. Now, clinical depression, you know, there's the kind of depression that comes, like if somebody got depressed right now because of the challenges that we're all facing in the world, that's a, you know, a, a short term thing. And then there's long-term chronic clinical depression that comes with kind of what your uh, question asker is alluding to, which is these long-term treat, you know, in treatment because it's affecting your ability to live your life. And in, in full disclosure, psychology and psychotherapy, this is one of the, the big targets that no one has really provided a solution to. We don't know why some brains go into chronic depression. We know the mechanism, which is why we're able to design some drugs, but we don't know the causal. So I would be 100% bullshitting if I was like, oh, you should do this. But I think that even at even the challenged mind still has some foundational rules. So everything I just said about like starting where you are, being consistent, doing what you can do applies. I have had chronic depression in the past. I mentioned self-harm in the, in the talk. I don't shy away from talking publicly about the fact that I used to hurt myself because I didn't like myself. But there are some things, some lessons that we can pull out of the literature that are helpful. Um, we know that cultivating strong relationships is one of the essential things to combat depression. We know that savoring when things are good uh, helps. And we know that things like um, gratitude, love, connection. And then there's all this new research about to come out. And I'm going to plug um, my thesis advisor. And I chose him for this reason. He has a book coming out called Learned Hopefulness that is targeted at using research around learned helplessness and its resolution toward people with depression. Um, and the book comes out, I think, in the next month. Uh, his name is Dan Tomasulo. He's a wonderful person. He actually is a clinician. Uh, and this is him applying research on hope theory and uh, its application to the depression population. Uh, and he's just that sounds really an cool, incredible actually. human being. Yeah, it's really neat. Um, it's actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug my stuff for a minute. Um, if you do buy one of the bundles on the OnePeg website, um, the, one of the bonuses is a reading list, and his is one of the recommended books in the reading list. Nice. Um, but the idea is to, to dive into, I, I realize I'm giving you a really long answer, but this is such a layered question. And I, I want to give the person that was brave enough to ask it a real answer. So learned helplessness <clears throat> was discovered by the man who then went on decades later to found positive psychology. His name is Martin Seligman. And what he discovered is back in the 70s, we were doing all this dog research where you'd, um, you'd chain a dog into a, a area with an electroshock and you'd teach them that the, it, it didn't, you know, it didn't have lasting damage. It just gave them like, like a little zing, like a, like sticking your tongue on a, um, one of those batteries. Nine, uh, 12 volt. There we go. Thank you. I was like, I know Dan will know. <laughs> um, so they'd it'd shock them and it'd teach them that like, oh, the floor shocks. 
And then some of the dogs would be able to jump away from the shock over a little wall, but other dogs would be chained in place. And if you chained a dog to that floor long enough and they could not get away from it, they'd stop trying. And that thing where you stop trying to get away from the bad is called learned helplessness. And so Seligman discovered learned helplessness. And then he started working on, well, what do you do to resolve it once somebody gives up? Did I lose you again? No. Okay, cool. You're good. Because video, my video dropped out, but I think it's my internet being dumb. Um, so what do you do once the dogs give up? And Seligman also then figured out that you had to reteach the dog to go over the wall. But part of how you do that is you'd have to basically drag the dog. You'd have to pick them up and move them over the wall again and again, just showing them that it was possible. So then he and his team eventually showed that learned helplessness is a phenomenon in humans. Um, and that if you model enough times for a human that feels helpless, that they could, and this is again, like why I'm talking about this publicly, is that when you believe you can get better, you keep trying. Um, my, my video has dropped out, Dan, but are you still there? Yep. Yep. We're okay, still good. Cool. Cool. I'm just, you know, like shoot me a text. if I, I don't know what's going on with the internet right now. I'll let you know. Um, You're good. Thank you. So if you, it, it all applies to humans because it's the foundations of our brain. Like how do, how can you look to the people in your life not the ones that like seem like everything's shiny. And this is also one of the things in this moment of our society is like, stop going on the internet and pretending that everything is fine all the time because it's not. And you're a human being. Hell yeah. And you're setting an example for other people that is fucking them up. Yep. Like you don't need to be better than the Joneses. Just do whatever you can do. Yeah. That phenomenon where everybody on social media shows everyone that their life is wonderful. This is why I never edit any of my pictures on social. Right. Because it because everything's amazing, and then everybody that on looks goes like, "Wow, their life is so amazing. Why is my life such shit?" And really, their life is shit, just like everyone else's, you know. Or maybe it's not, but even in even still, it doesn't have to be doctored to the point where the only thing you show everyone is the stuff that's amazing. Right, you and know? that's why, like, like two posts immediately came to mind. Last summer, I did two posts. One where uh, my obviously my hair is quite curly. I did. I, did you see the one picture with like, I, I didn't. I didn't style my hair one day. I just let it dry naturally. And it looks like Einstein. Yes. Um, and then the one picture on my social media where you see my ass, tons of cellulite. Because I think that trainers who are going off and pretending that at 35, their bodies are flawless are just right. making other women hate themselves. Because they've got to they've got to get everything airbrushed to fuck. <clears throat> um, anyway, so I, we went down a weird rabbit hole there. But yeah. like, so so look to the people in your life that have been suffering with depression or whatever mental health thing that you've been diagnosed with and how, like, how did they get better and how did they do it? So like Tim Ferriss talking about being bipolar and what it's like to be this like world famous person who also has like crippling depression bouts and how his fear that if he medicates it, he won't be able to do the Tim Ferriss thing anymore. Like that was a beautiful moment in the world because everyone out there who thinks that they're a freaking weirdo all of a sudden it's like oh wait but he did it okay what can i do um so that to me is a big one is like looking for help um specifically to you know this person asked about the pressure to be a nine to five and be effective in that way um Obviously, I mentioned that I have a chronic illness. I work with a lot of people who have chronic illnesses. Um, and the reality, it's it's been so such a weird mindfuck in the last few weeks as everyone's slowly freaking out about having to self-isolate. But like, if you have a chronic illness, it, chances are at some point you've had to lock yourself in your apartment for your own health. And now all these people are like freaking out Dude, that they might have to do it. How it's many like, How many people with chronic depression, right? Because I've had depression like my entire fucking life. The, the moment that uh, people started coming out saying like, oh, they might be shutting everything down and people have to stay home. I was just like, <sighs> right. Yeah. Because yes. that's, that's what it is. Like, all you mean like, I don't have to go anywhere. Like I didn't want to anyway, but now, now they're like justifying it for me. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it was, it's the weirdest thing, right? Yeah. So I think <laughs> that, um, sorry, I got distracted by chat for a second, but to come back to this nine to five pressure, Obviously, in this moment, 
we're in a weird pocket reality and I'm hoping that we get to go to a different, better reality soon. Cause yeah. like yeah, yeah, yeah. mind fuck, but it's, we are now in a moment that the whole planet is interconnected and you can invent who you're going to be in the world in a way like never before. Absolutely. So when we were growing up and our parents used to tell you not to game all the time, it was because they had no way to know that you were going to be able to make your living this way in the same way that like, you know, I took what three extra sessions of gym in high school, like, because I just liked playing games with my body. Like, I didn't know that there was such a thing as people would let me study biomechanics and then teach them how to move and pay me good money for it. Or like write shit that you can download on the internet. And right. Then, like, so, so that pressure of like, I have to be this way. Almost everyone I know who suffers from some kind of chronic depression is also wildly creative from their place of, of suffering. So my, one of, one of my big drums that I beat is like, how can you use the thing that you are going through to contribute in any way to other people? So uh, a beautiful example, Kim Krantz is this incredible artist. She just came out with a beautiful book um, called Blossoms and Bones, and it's about her eating disorder. And she's this like famous artist who like helps you unlock your creativity, but she was truly on the struggle bus and through like, she woke up every morning and decided to draw how it felt to be depressed and have an eating disorder that come, came out of her depression. And it is so fucking beautiful. So how can you use whatever it is? And I don't care if it's depression or it's anxiety or it's just like, whatever. Can you use that to create something that will help somebody, how can you contribute in a very meaningful way yep. to whatever's going on in your world? Yep. Um, and in terms of the consistency, like you've got all the reasons, but you feel like you're low on your good habits. On your good days, have a stack of what you're gonna do to create the state for yourself of what you're gonna create in your world. And every time you have a good day, run that same stack and on your mediocre days, try to do the same stack to create the state. And on your less than awesome days, be like, that's just who we are today and do what you can. Mm -hmm. um, and I can dive into I like the science underneath that. If you want me to, I can get more specific about what I mean by a stack if you want me to. Um, but that's, that's my best advice from a non-clinical perspective. I like that idea that, that maybe that would help, you know, and, and I, I'm sure this person, um, uh, if they're, uh, I don't know if they're here right now. I don't think they are, but, um, they could be sleeping. Uh, but if, uh, you know, they'll, they'll probably watch the, uh, the VOD back and, uh, and be able to see the answer to their question. I'm sure that they'll appreciate it. They're very, they're a very, very nice person. Um, well, to that very nice person, my email address is darlene at darlene.coach. Please reach out to me if you need more details on any of that or you just like want some help. And anybody who is hearing this and is like, I want to learn this shit, like one of the bundles on the website is a discount on my coaching package. Um, so like feel, feel free. <laughs> um, and I feel like a bunch of people put stuff in chat and then I had to refresh because it froze. So Dan, if there's anything in there or anybody wants to like restate, unfortunately I lost everything y'all just said. <laughs> That's okay. Um, okay. So <clears throat> I got one, uh, another one. Yeah. Hit me. Is it a scientifically proven, uh, is it scientifically proven that the, I am not enough feeling which narcissists suffer from leads to addictions, including gaming addiction. One therapist on YouTube claimed most addiction cases in her career had this trait, narcissistic hmm. personality disorder. That's I, interesting. I don't know well, anything I'm, Again, about I'm that. not a clinician or a diagnostician. And so working through clinical diagnoses is outside of both my scope and my education. Um, what The little slice I do know about narcissism is there are some conflicting theories about what actually causes it. Um, the one that I 
I heard this very recently and I have not researched it yet. So I, I don't feel qualified to answer this question from a scientific perspective. What I will say is the theory that I really appreciated that I think we're seeing play out on a national scale right now is um, that narcissism is actually a very weak sense of self that causes people to try to build an ego that is based off of external reflection. So it's what's going to make people like me the most or react in a certain way to me the most positive to give me external feedback. Um, and as we watch the the orange Muppet, can I talk, can I say that shit right now? I don't know. <laughs> Try not to get too political. Okay, sure. Never mind. I'll do something else. Um, so <laughs> narcissists, Kardashians, can I make fun of the Kardashians? Kardashians are um, fine. <laughs> right. So the Kardashians, um, they're building their externalized selves on what's going to get the most play and therefore make them the most money. Um, and yes. so there's plenty of people that like react to the Kardashians with the belief that they're narcissists. Right. Um, and it's because you're basing what, who you are and what you're doing in the world fully externally with a very weak sense of yourself and what you're about. Right. Um, so I don't, does that cause addiction? I don't, that is not the theory of addiction that I've been exposed to. Um, my understanding of addiction in the literature right now, kind of the prevailing thought on it is that it is, so you specifically, he mentioned video game addiction, but it's, this is the thing that's giving me the biggest serotonin and dopamine stimulus. And we are wired in our brains to want that. Like our brains and our bodies are drawn to the things that, cause that's what kept our ancestors alive, right? The things that gave you those hormone dumps right. back right. in, back in, uh, you know, the day was like babies and sex and food that was like high in fats and sugars. And those were all things that we needed to propagate the species. So the, the brains that the organisms that were drawn to them made more babies because they were getting better food and they were having more sex. Um, but now we have all these other stimulus that give us those dumps. And so when other things in your life don't feel good and you're drawn into the, to the, um, the stimulus that do, you can create a feedback loop where that's the only thing that feels good, 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 good. Um, I think part of the trick with all of this and why I keep saying like, well, what do you want to work on? What's internally motivated is because your motivation directly speaks to what actually gives you the positive reinforcement feedback loop. And so if I only do the things I should be doing because I'm externally motivated, then I don't get the serotonin. I don't get the dopamine. I don't get the oxytocin. And then I don't want to keep doing it. I'm not setting new neuroplastic grooves. I'm, I'm fighting against my own physiology. So what's, what's going to be the internally motivated, caring, beneficial uh, improvement that then makes it easier for you to connect with others to contribute meaningfully? Because contribution also, like when you contribute to the things you care about, you also get all of those things. Like it feels good to me when I like do something like this and people are like, yeah, that's awesome. Yay. Great. I agree with her. She's like, that feels nice that you're benefiting from my efforts. Um, so how can you contribute? How can you, so, and like, like, again, I'm not a clinician and I'm not an addiction specialist, so I don't want to give you the impression that I am, but being proactive and connecting and being open to other people. And now at least video games, it's a lot of connection, right? Like now you're like, look at you right now. There's, there were 200 people prime to watch you play video games on a Sunday afternoon. This is your community. Yep. So it's not like when it was like you alone in your bedroom and we didn't know if you were jerking off or you were, you know, playing something like right. that was right. supposed to be a joke. <laughs> I'm just letting you go. <laughs> I'm talking a lot. Yes. This is my sister narcotics. Yes. Yeah. This is my younger sister. Yep. Yes. We're not actually twins. We just play twins on the internet. You can't tell. I mean, we look almost exactly the same. Calling on, but yeah, thanks, Dizzy. Um, yeah, so you had said something about um, um, in your in your talks, you talked about uh, you know self improvement with the purpose of kind of giving things away for that sense of fulfillment, and that's really what it leads to. And I completely agree with that. Um, 
the the times in my uh, professional career when I felt the absolute best, like on my best of best days were days where uh, I had nothing to gain from doing something nice for someone else, mm -hmm. right? And part of part of um, the the cool thing about being in the position I am now is uh, I look at it like this platform just gives me a whole lot more reach to do exactly that. Like once I get to the point where I can, um, because, and that's what I've tried to instill on, on your niece and nephew is that, uh, you have to be at least at some point in your life at different points, you know, whatever, as regular as you can be doing something that is like truly selfless because that gives you that, like that sense of, of fulfillment it makes you feel really good and they've they've you know and i'm sure that you've seen and read you know lots of studies and literature on um um being charitable and how that can improve you know yourself right oh yeah there's a really great it's such a simple experiment um and i don't remember where it was and i can i don't know if anybody cares let reach out i'll send it to you but it's um you give random people I think it's 20 bucks and you tell half of them so you measure how they're doing, you measure their well being. you tell half of them, here's money to go spend it on yourself. And you tell the other half, spend it on a stranger, right? Spend it on somebody else. And the people who spend it on themselves think that they're going to feel much better. And they actually are kind of like, meh, the people who spend it on other people think that it's only going to make them meh better. And they actually end up with a much more significant increase to their subjective well-being. Um, so Isaac, the, the person who's done the most robust work on this is Isaac Prilotensky, and his work is in meaning and mattering. It's like you have to be important to other people, but you also have to be able to contribute to those people so that it creates a reciprocal feedback loop. Um, so, you know, to me, one of the things that I really figured out through my education, because one of the nice things about studying human flourishing is that like, you're constantly trying all of this stuff out on yourself. Like as you learn it, you're like, oh, oh shit, what does that look like? Um, so one of the things I figured out for myself was I am, I am aggressively independent to the point of it being a problem sometimes. <laughs> and uh, no, that's not true at all, is it, Dan? No, you never. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> Ta -da. So what I realized was like, oh, wait, I never give the people that love me the mechanism to help me. I am too busy being like, no, I could do it myself. <laughs> I have no idea what that feels like. Uh -huh. um, so what I started doing when I read this, that literature on meaning and mattering, I was like, well, maybe I should let people help me. Maybe that'll feel good for them. And then like all of these nice things started happening where I was giving people the opportunity. I was telling, first I had to tell them what I needed. And even if it was something I could have provided for myself, I'd let them have the chance to. And then like they would feel good and I would feel good. And then I'd do something nice for them. And it started all of these exchanges where like, and what I realized was like when, when relationship specialists talk about the difference between codependence and interdependence, like codependence is when you need the other person to be functional and you're like the leaning tower of Pisa and if one of you falls, you're fucked. Interdependence is when you're proactively choosing to allow someone to help you. Uh, and that's how it should be. I was like, oh, I've been doing this wrong for a really long time. <laughs> So what is it when you just like toss someone out of the way and like go, I'm helping you. And then you just do it. <laughs> cause sometimes, cause sometimes you're like, I have this get out of my way plebeian. And then you just kind of like grab the heavy thing and, and move it for them, whether they wanted you to or not. <laughs> so it depends on the context. Right. So, um, you can, I mentioned the learned helplessness thing earlier. Yes. You can cause a state of helplessness in another person by taking over the task. It's true. It's so true. this is especially relevant in parenting and in uh, romantic relationships because if I give a little kid a puzzle and they're struggling with it and I go, oh, it goes like this, click, click, click. If you watch video of this, the kids get irritated and they get sad and they get mopey and then they don't try anymore. I don't know what that feels like at all. No, I don't I can't imagine. Um not that we had a parent that did that kind of stuff. 
we didn't grow up in that household. This didn't cause major <laughs> issues later. I didn't develop all of these skills because I had to in adulthood with awareness. <laughs> nope. Not so, us. so, uh, to that effect, just from personal experience, I have seen it where, uh, I'm, I'm the type of person where like from a kid's standpoint, like if one of the kids gets frustrated and I can see that they're visibly frustrated because they're trying to struggle through something, I am much more apt to be like, Oh, do you want me to help you? And then if they say yes, I just do it. But then what happens is they get so used to dad taking care of it that they just get to the point where that that bar of like I don't want to have to deal with this anymore keeps getting lower and lower and lower and lower and then eventually yep. it just becomes like and dad can you just do this for me and I'm like sure why not I'll be super dad and then I started realizing like wait a minute you can get your own damn glass out the cupboard you're tall enough like what are you what do you need me for like go do it yourself and, and then they kind of look at me like what you know the in- all of Gen Z um, I'm trying to remember what they called. There's a theory, a social development theory that Jonathan Haidt, um, if you if you are interested in this, it's called The Coddling of the American Mind is a book by Jonathan Haidt. Um, and I met him in the fall and he's a fascinating human being. And you don't even know you're um, doing it. You know what I mean? Huh? You don't even know you're doing it. That's like the funny thing. Yeah. Well, but the trick of it is that we've now done it to an entire generation where we're like, I want it to be easy for my kid. And we just moved all the obstructions out of right. the way. And now they like don't want to do fucking anything. My child is amazing. You shut up, teacher. You know? No, it's not even like that. It's just like, oh, I don't want my kid to, to feel bad because my parents made me feel bad. So I'm not going to allow you to feel pain. And now you grew a little right. narcissist who has no resilience. Right. right. Um, so. The, so when you see your kid get frustrated, the the research is showing that the, the way to do it is to empower them by teaching the skills of problem solving. So it's like, instead of solving the puzzle for them, it's like, okay, well, could you turn one of the pieces? Or what if, does this piece go with this piece or this piece? Like you make it simpler. You take the You take the big task and you make it this big, and then you string them together so that they learn how to solve the puzzle. Right. Instead of solving the puzzle. Right. Um, like learning how to read and breaking up words into syllables and sounds that yes, they can make. And, yes. Yeah. Um, and I forgot how we ended. Oh, uh, us. learn. We. Oh, so you learn helpless. You, you can trigger learned helplessness in other adults by just like solving the problem. So when it's something like, I'm strong enough, I can do this. Like you have the benefit of having a sister who's quite strong. Thank you. Um, so like, if you notice, yeah, it meant like you shoving me out of the way and just taking over. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. But it's a task I was supposed to do. Stop <laughs> trying to do it for me in the first fucking place. So like when it comes to our grandmother, you know, our grandmother has trouble walking and she can't get upstairs. And whenever she comes over to our mother's house, yeah, I, mom's always I, like, Hey, it is you... my job to yeah. get her up the stairs. Yeah, and meanwhile, and my I mom ask for your help if I need and it. Mom turns to me and goes, help your grandmother. And then I walk out there and you're like there. <laughs> <laughs> like it's not like she's got it like what do you need me for you know yeah um but if you notice the few times that our male family members have tried to take my job away i'm like get the fuck out of my way yeah yeah you get mad um, <laughs> because it makes me feel like you don't understand that i deadlift all you know 250 yeah i can move betty right exactly get out of my way yeah, right. <laughs> um but i think so people are responding to this in chat and it's like um you know, how, that we're seeing this in workplaces that people can't seem to handle menial tasks. And it's like, when you couldn't, like when you haven't been taught how to problem solve and then all of a sudden you're in the professional work environment and your boss is like freaking out and, and the boomers are all like, meh, that the millennials are fragile. It's like, well, no, we're responding to the world that we've received and like, I'm, I'm so sorry that it's not the world that you got when, when you were, you know, in the eighties and nineties and it was normal and good. Um, but yes, the way that we work through that is by breaking down skills and abilities to a level that is doable. I think the other trick is that millennials have received such a, a shit social deal. And now we're seeing it with Gen Z as well, that unless there's meaning and and purpose and an understanding of why something is important. We don't want our time wasted on nothing. And that wasn't the social contract that a lot of the earlier, that the earlier generations were buying into. So they think we're lazy and it's like, no, we're disempowered. There is a major difference. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so uh, fun story. 
uh, I don't know if I ever told you this one. Uh, when when uh, Doctor Canada, my son, was uh, in. Is that what we call your son? Dr. Yeah, that's Canada? that's his username, Doctor Canada. Yeah. Okay, that's funny. So when he was <laughs> anyway. when he was in grade, well, in grade school, when he was in third grade, uh, it, it had been known already that he was behind in his understanding of the English language, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had like a a conference with. Uh, like it was like the special ed department and his like grade school teacher and the principal and uh, his mom and myself. And we all sat in and, and his grandmother and we all sat in this circle, like in a classroom one day after school to talk about whether or not he needed like special education classifications. And he did. Um, but there was like all of this conversation about like ways that we could help him with reading and his, his mom was kind of like, well, you know, like he's very smart and like just talked about like all of the good things about him, which is great. But in that context, it was a question of like critical thinking and whether or not he needed help reading. And it started kind of like goes around this circle and they're talking about like, you know, him and like what he needs and like that kind of stuff. And then it comes to me and I go, my son's lazy. And they just all turned and looked at me like, and I was like, I love him but he doesn't want to read and he's lazy and we have to motivate him (laughs) because everybody was just like, Oh, he's just, you know, he's a little behind and he's very smart and like all this. And I was like, my son's lazy and he needs people to like crack the whip on him because he won't sit there and learn it otherwise because everyone lets him get away with like being lazy. So, and like, they all looked at me like I had 17 heads, you know what I mean? (laughs) And, and uh, then I had to kind of like qualify it. Like, look, he just doesn't want to read. But we like I want to and then then, you know, immediately afterward, it was like, okay well, he really likes comic books. So I'll read and have him read and then he'll draw a picture and then I'll have him write the caption to the picture as I'm reading him, like whatever it is that I'm reading him. And that turned into like him reading stuff and then drawing because he likes to draw at the same time. And, you know, like trying to find things like get him interested in it. So it was well, just really you know funny. How I know that I did know this story. Do you remember what we gave him for Christmas that year? Yes. yes. Yeah. And then you gave him graphic novels, which he still yeah. has, and he yeah. uh, and he gets the new uh, he gets the new ones in the series as they come out. And yep, yep. he that's, still that's still how loves them. I know. Them. I know this story. The only the uh, only books he has next to his bed are the Amulet uh, graphic novels. That's literally but everything. To- To tie this back to some of what we've been talking about when we talk about self-efficacy and how do you build. So to define the term, self-efficacy is your own belief that you can affect change in your life. So how effective do you think you are that if I, you know, I'm 100% sure that if I drop this pen, it's going to drop to my table. Am I 100% sure that if I decide tomorrow I'm going to start a new fitness regimen that I'm going to do it and it's going to have an effect and it's going to change, right? Like that's self-efficacy. Will my efforts produce what I want? Right. So to like... You're going to start a YouTube channel tomorrow. I already have a YouTube channel. It goes with my podcast. But you're going to be yeah. you're going to be consistent and upload videos every other day. And not every other day. Every- I don't have time for that. I got a fucking job like a real person. <laughs> what are you What are you talking about? You're you're confined to quarters. <laughs> Fair. Um, so anyway, when it comes to building efficacy, externally motivated. Wait, did you just say extra- I don't have a real job in a manner? <laughs> I was waiting. There we go. I'm like, wow, how did nobody pick that up? <laughs> Wait, but you have to come back. I she's, have to go pee. I can't be in charge she's of this. The, she's the streamer now. <laughs> Look at me. Um, anyway, that, that if you're externally motivated and you do the thing, it doesn't build self-efficacy. It causes resentment. But to your point, like when you were talking about Mr. Canada, which I'm really struggling to reframe that one in my head, um, that by finding what would internally motivate him, providing him that stimulus, you got the skill adaptation you wanted and made him feel better about the work. And he's still, and he's been, he's been behind up until now. Like it's been years, but he's been, but he's been gaining this much every year. He's been catching up, and uh, this year was the first year that he didn't have to have, um, you know, the the special assistance 
stuff. So That's like, great. Yeah. So this is as of ninth grade. It took from third grade to ninth grade, but as of ninth grade, he's at the same level as like the rest of the kids in his class, which is sweet. You know? I don't know how I feel about being referred to as female one peg. <laughs> I don't know. Given given how this has gone so far, I think I'm the male coach dar. I'm down. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So when it, if we try to apply this to like adult change psychology, it's like okay, well, why are you doing the thing, and can you find a way to reframe it to the thing that's actually internally motivated because like it's one thing to be like i'm gonna make myself go work out because i won't find a partner if i'm too chubby um it's a whole nother thing to be like i wanna you know i want when i finally find a partner to feel really confident so i'm gonna go work on this thing that will help my confidence right those are two completely different framing mechanisms right about like so what's what are you telling yourself (laughs) Uh, about why you're doing it and how can you like instead of forcing him to read Moby Dick have him read some Spidey (laughs) right and now he's he's reading To Kill a Mockingbird and he's actually like into the story like he tells me about it and I'm like you're reading like real literature like who are you whose child are you you know like it's it's interesting Wise man, I also have the exact same experience. I've had multiple surgeries and my partner likes my scars by some weird, strange turn of the world. And like, I'm just going to throw out there that there's somebody for everybody. And no, ma- no matter what vessel you're stomping around in, um, homie, there, there's somebody that's into it. Homie, I gained I gained 60 pounds in like four months and I got permanent stretch marks on the insides of my legs. You know, I still found somebody that can tolerate my stupid ass. and The only person probably that can tolerate my stupid ass. <laughs> And actually, like, want to um, want to sleep next to me at night, you know? Well, most nights. <laughs> most nights. Some some nights. Some nights, I I I confine myself to the couch, and then she yells at me because I didn't come to bed, you know. But of course not, because yeah. you know. Th- well, it's it's my it's my own else. it's my own stupid guilty conscience. See, because yeah. it's like I didn't screw up, and brr, brr, you know what I mean? And then and then I try to like grandstand, and then she's like, "I'm going to bed," and then I'm, then I sit there and go like, "I'm a fucking idiot." And Go then, to bed. Everyone you know what want, I mean? every woman wants but to now, be cuddled. Now it's now it's now it's a different case. Like I I, yeah. I haven't done that in years. You know, I'm just it's yeah. just me being a fucking twelve year old in my own head. You know, well knock knock that shit off. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I yeah. my professional opinion is knock that shit off. Well, I'm a much happier person now. So <laughs> yeah, I'm aware of that. Yeah. Um. And yeah, the body <laughs> issues thing is so weird. Like I mentioned earlier, that man person is like six inches shorter than me, and but but to me he's like the perfect proportions and size and shape and body. Like I, I tell him all the time, I'm like, God, I, I, I love that vessel. Your consciousness is stomping around in. Um, but it's also to me, I'm like, well, why would you want to be with a giant? And he's like, Nope, you're perfect. And it's like, yep, we all, we all have a story that we're telling ourselves about the thing we're riding around in. And it is just a story. So can I tell you that um, dizzy doom? I have a, I have a giant, giant man crush on her boyfriend. He has he has like luscious locks and he's a streamer and he's amazing. I didn't understand at first that you were talking about someone else's boyfriend and I'm like you haven't met my man person. No, like, I was so confused and no. I'm like and he doesn't have luscious locks. What are you talking about? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. It's her her boyfriend is uh, this guy Dottie Hack and uh, he's another streamer and uh, he's a drummer and he's a he's a musician. He's an awesome, awesome, awesome guy. He's one of my favorite people ever. Love, love the dude. He's amazing. But anyway. Excellent. Um, well, when I was on the other day, one of your guys uh, asked me a question then, and I want to get back to it too, which was about people who have trouble getting to sleep, but they don't want to use sleep meds. Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's right. There was that question. I completely forgot about it. It wasn't in my notebook. Yeah, you, you should just feel horrible about that. Well, I am an um, idiot. Wait, before we do that, are we going to do the cuteness off? Um... So, so that here's, here's a, well, I'll, I'll posit the question to chit chat. So, um, so my sister has this absolutely adorable kitty cat named Bruce. And as we all know, you can uh, guess who he's named after. Yeah, we have, we have Arnie. So the, uh, the question was whether or not we were going to go head to head in a, uh, whose pet is cuter contest and, uh, decide if that's something that you guys wanted. 
Yeah, but you guys haven't seen. And Arnie is very cute. <laughs> the chat's like Arnie wins. <laughs> I'm not going to question that Arnie is cute. Yeah, let's see. So, so here's the so thing. How do I put a pic? Can I put a picture in chat? Uh, you would have to screen share your screen instead of your camera. So okay. on the on hold the on, hold on. let me open it. Yeah. I feel like you guys should see my background too. Because it's awesome. I have so much stuff on my desktop. <laughs> this is chaos. Wait, so so who who wins, Chad? Arnie or Thermal Arnie? Did I just lose you? No. Okay, sorry. No. Streaming is a real Arnie job. My cat. Um, uh, punks, we're going to talk about melatonin in a session. Second, dogs over cats. Okay, so how do I do this? Um, this I, is the. I think this is the only time that chat would actually vote in favor of anything that's going on with me at all. Because <laughs> like yeah, everyone, so everyone. This, we do a, a picture, a vote on which one of us is cuter. <laughs> yeah. So like everyone is biased toward Arnie, but if it was like if it was like me versus a fucking wildebeest, like you could Photoshop yourself with a snaggletooth and a hunchback, and they'd still say you won. You know what I mean? Sure, but I mean it's just you with boobs, so it's kind of ridiculous anyway. Fair. Um, uh, choose which screen you'd like. To I only have one screen. Do it. Why won't it go? Screen share. You should have a window that pops up that says like you can share your screen. Did it change? No. Why am I dumb at this? <laughs> There's a thing that says turn on screen share, like right next to where oh. your camera icon is. Yeah, and I did it, and it said choose which screen you'd like to share, and I double click on it, and now like, God, your your people are gonna think I'm so dumb right now. <laughs> no, that's they won't, cause they're just as stupid. So great. Trust me, you're way way more intelligent than just about everybody in here. They'll they'll tell you so, so you don't even have to worry about it. I don't know why it's not. So I'm 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 doing the thing, guys. I swear I'm not dumb. <laughs> it's not and I'm I mean I'm I have a relatively high technical acumen and this still like I'm clicking all the clicks. Oh, there we go. My Ta -da! Discord window wasn't big enough to you have the it. button that said share. Yeah, so you can so yeah, so maximize uh so this is Brucey. Yeah, he has a mustache. He's actually he does have a super mustache. cute cat. And so that you can see, uh, he's got his little Batman mask on. Um, so this was the other night when I was. I can't. Like I can't make it bigger. Wait, maybe. Well, I kind of can. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, that was day three self quarantine. He was being my nurse, um, coming to check my temperature. Uh, so yeah, that's my little buddy. Uh, I have him and his brother Midnight. They're brothers and best friends. Yeah. Um, their Instagram is at Bruce and Midnight. If anybody and our, likes cats, our mom uh, has their mother and one of the other sibling kitties, and then one of our aunts has the other two, right? Mm -mm. Or one? She just has Brooklyn, and Brooklyn. then one of my friends uh, adopted Luna. Right. right. <clears throat> but I so their mom was a foster that I took in. Um, some a holes uh, turned her out around Christmas time. We tend year. to just find pets. Yeah, and so it was five years ago, the week between Christmas and New Year's, um, these people had gone away for the holiday and just turned her mom out, turned their mom out, I should say, and I took I took her in because it was bitter cold, and then I realized when she was already in my apartment that she was pregnant, and because um, of how much she was eating, I was like, oh, guess we're having kittens, because at that point, if I take her to a shelter, they would have terminated the kittens, and I karmically just can't handle that. Um, so yeah, no. she had five kittens in our bedroom, the old we, my ex-husband and I, and um, Bruce was the first one to figure out how to get out of the box, and he, the first thing he did was climb in my lap, and then he was the first one to figure out how to climb anything else, and it was so he could climb the side of the bedding to get into bed with me, and he's just been like my little snuggle fuzz butt ever since then yeah he's pretty awesome um, he's pretty great he's really stupid um but one of my friends <laughs> nearly killed him when he was a kitten so it was uh, <clears throat> partly a reaction to that um that he you gotta switch back just, to your webcam 
Jeez. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I was just letting everyone enjoy three yeah. of Brucey. Anyway, so you go. That's Bruce. Um, so he a friend nearly killed him when he was kitten. Um, but he lived. But it made him uh really afraid of people and kind of scared of everything. Um, and Midnight will probably jump in my lap at some point, and I'll show you Midnight. But that's Buddy. It's my buddies. I don't know, man. We got um, we have we have some pretty. This some... is his little brother. This is Midnight. Midnight. Who was born midnight, at midnight? Chill as hell too. He's really friendly. Um, but I, I like to think it's because you know you train a dog, but you gentle a cat. And I would like to think it's because I did a good job gentling my cats when they were kittens. Yeah, that's how um, uh, that's how uh, Oreo is here. She loves everyone and everything. We've got, we have tons of uh, video because, you know, I have like a dedicated camera for the dog almost always. Yeah. 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 And uh, the cat will jump right up on the couch next to the dog and curl up and they like spoon and stuff. It's adorable. Like she rubs right. her face on his face and like licks him and like tries to clean him and stuff. Like he's, he's her giant baby. It's Someday, pretty adorable. I will not live in New York City and then I will go dog. Um, but I think that, I think as I scroll through chat, more people chose Arnie. Yeah. Arnie can't lose. So like it's because <laughs> it's Arnie, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he can't, he can't lose. Okay. It can be if it, Arnie. If it were, if we're, I'm, I'm, still... I'm telling you, if it were anything versus me, like I lose. So it could be me versus like a, a rock. And I lose, you know? Well, so. as long as, so, you know, for many years I have in the back of my head been like, okay, when we were growing up, the two of you were the attractive siblings. Like I was really, I was awkward. I was a little too thick. Uh, I was head and shoulders taller than everybody. Like I was, I was not the cool sibling. And so for a couple of years, I've been like, no, now is my time to shine. I'm the hot one now. This is awesome. <laughs> so as long as I'm still catching ground on that one, I'm good. There you go. There you go. Can I say, can I say that without getting totally roasted? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Nobody can say shit. You I guys don't, don't get it. to, you guys don't get to say anything negative to my sister. Or I'll fucking ban you. Shut the fuck up. You feel, <laughs> you don't think I can handle it? No, it's not a matter of whether or not you can handle it. I don't want to have to put up with their bullshit. That's pretty much okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Fuck them. Big brother. He's being my brother. Oh. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So now let's talk about sleep. Enough about our, our pets. Yeah. And... So getting to sleep without wanting to take meds. Yeah. So, um, somebody mentioned melatonin in the chat. So let's, let's handle this in a not bullshit, like Instagram or like, I made an infographic that has five tips for your sleep. Like, like here's the science. So there's two mechanisms of sleep. There's circadian cycle, which we, most of us are familiar with this like 24 hour rhythm that your body wants to be in. Uh, and then there is sleep drive, which is as anything that you do over the course of the day that uses any mental resource which is basically everything. Uh, the chemical process of that in your brain produces a chemical byproduct called adenosine. And as adenosine accumulates, um, it, it messes up your brain is the short version. So when you sleep, it cleans adenosine. And I think it's really interesting how this happens. So I'm going to nerd out for a second. As you start to fall asleep, your brain, brain very slightly shrinks and, uh, cerebral spinal fluid i think it's what it's called like flushes the brain and cleans it and then when you start to come back up out of your sleep cycle it grows again and it like sponges it back out um and i just think that's cool that we figured that out that that's happening while you're sleeping so sleep drive works like thirst or um other drives in the body that like the longer you go without dealing with them the more of a need they become so like the longer i go without drinking water the more i need water the longer you go without sleep the more you need sleep and if you go long enough you'll either like go insane or, or just fall asleep spontaneously um so sleep cycle is one thing that you can very easily hack i mean easily soft quotes easy it's like it's harder for some people and i and we own that that if you are going to sleep and waking up at the same time, that's one of the easiest ways that you can program your sleep. But also our brains and our bodies are meant to function in ritual. So if you, and I don't mean like ohm ritual, I mean like patterns. So light votive so, candles and pray to Nikita chat. I mean, I prefer, I, pre I prefer, I prefer Ganesha if you're going to be a smart ass about it, but. Um, well, Nikita is our Lord and savior. He's the lead developer of Escape from Tarkov. 
oh dude i don't know great yeah, no see see the shit i don't know <laughs> um so anyway <laughs> So if you're like watching TV until you get sleepy and you're getting drowsy on the couch every night and then you go and lay in bed and you can't fall asleep, that's because you programmed your brain like, oh, you fall asleep on the couch and then you lay in bed and stare at the ceiling. And that's how these two spaces work. Also, so, I shouldn't I shouldn't fall asleep at my desk every day. No, it's not wise, my mm. brother. We live such different lives in some oh. ways. <laughs> oh. So if you know, like, all right, I want to be in bed at, I was going to use my times and then I realized who I'm talking to, um, nine, if I want to be asleep at nine, I have to be in bed at eight with no screens on. Never mind. I get up at five, at five a.m. At 2 a.m., dick. Yeah, but I get up at five. You don't get oh, up at five. I get up at six. And Which you is only bad. sleep four hours? Four to five hours and then I usually crash out like hard like on day uh, seven. Okay, you guys are going to watch me chastise my brother on the internet. Daniel Stanley. <laughs> Thanks for telling the internet that my middle name is Stanley. That's awesome. Why are you? I told him the other day what your childhood nickname was. Um, why are you treating your body like a rental car? Uh, thanks. Thanks. Chat didn't know that one. It's awesome. Uh, sorry, but come on. All right, so that's not enough sleep for a healthy brain. So, fuck. I'm. Can I, Dan? Do I have your permission to totally rip you a new one right now? I think you just did. So you're not going to tell me anything I don't already know. The well, thing is, I, the thing is, 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 I'm a fucking workaholic with this, and the majority of the time that I spend awake is either with with fam or like when they go to bed. Then I have like four to five hours of productivity time, and then I pass out. I only, it, it actually, it's only like three or four days a week that that happens. And it's usually like when I have to get up and like take the kids to school in the morning and then I come home and take a nap because, okay. because I so, don't function. Okay. So. so you brought up a really, that, that was actually a nice lead thing. So it's not, it doesn't have to all be in one shot. Like we've been programmed because we live in a post-industrial revolution world that um, like, okay, this is your time for sleep and this is your time for work. But when you look at studies of civilizations before they were industrialized, um, especially before they get lights and television, we naturally engage in something called biphasic sleep. And a lot of their studies now showing that humans who have biphasic sleep patterns have better health outcomes than humans who try to force themselves into the eight and a half hour box of like, this is when you sleep. That's monophasic sleep. So if we're so like, cultures that had one sleep chunk, like Mexican culture sleep. kind of stuff, traditionally. Yeah. It's CS. CS is a, a, a perfect example. Um, but it also in, in like American journals, you'd see this in, in uh, rural, like farming cultures, you'd, you'd go to sleep. Uh, you'd wake up for like an hour, hour and a half in the middle of the night, and then you'd go back to sleep and have another couple cycles. So there are like anecdotal stories about like, going next door to hang out with Jim every morning at 1 a.m. because I know he's awake and they, like we chill for an hour and then we go back to sleep. Um, There's also a theory that that's when most reproduction was happening. Hmm. Mm. Interesting. Um, yep. So we, so most of us in adulthood wake up at some point in the middle of the night and we feel like we can't get back to sleep. Most of us have that experience at this point and it's because naturally you're, you're looking for a biphasic rhythm. Um, and since learning that purely anecdotally for myself and the people I've coached with this is like, if I'm telling myself in the middle of the night, like, ah, I got to get up at four and I only have this many hours left. And then I look at my phone and now I'm like staring into the sun, um, and providing too much stimulus to my brain. And then like, that's going to mess it all up. But if I wake up and I think, oh, I always wake up at 1am by phasic sleep. Let me like tell myself a story or meditate or like think about all the things I'm grateful for, you're more likely to fall back asleep if you do that and you get yourself calm. Yeah, like you're not getting you, lost in the fact that you're like, you have insomnia or something and like getting yourself all worked up over it, you mean? Like you just kind of like treat it like, oh, it's just like my natural deal and like you stay relaxed kind of thing, you mean? Bingo. Yeah. yeah. That's, um, a, that's a cool that's a cool concept. Yeah. Because like, so it's, it's that'll it's happen to me. That happens to me sometimes. Like I'll wake up at like 4 a.m. and I'm like, why am I awake right now? And then, you know, I, I end up puttering around doing other things. And then it's like, wow, I'm kind of tired. I'm going to go back to bed. 
Bingo. Um, but the trick is to keep in low light to avoid blue light, which I think is really hard, especially for gamers, because they are like, well, I got this hour. Let me play something like, no, well, you're especially especially when you do it for work. Because uh, like yeah. it, what's funny is like is like uh, the vast majority of the time that I spend like gaming uh, is is when I'm live and then I'm doing like video editing around that, you know, for whatever it is, you know, that I got an idea for that I'm doing a project on or whatever. And then there's like that hour where it's like I'm not working and I could like actually enjoy a video game. You know, <laughs> like I could play something for an hour before I go to bed. And sometimes that hour glasses? is it like, what's that? Do you wear amber glasses for that? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. So let's talk about amber glasses. So I have, so I have, I have, um, I have a, like a fucking NASA computer monitor that actually like knocks that stuff out of the monitor, like when it's on. Like there's a setting where you can like turn off or reduce like the amount of blue light or whatever, so it's easier on your eyes. If that makes sure. sense. I so mean, it, which is kind of nice. Should I assume that your audience knows what we're talking about? Yeah, you guys, you guys know about like blue light and and uh, and like causing headaches and eye strain and all that stuff, right? Like blue light filters and. Well, I think kind of the cool thing is, um, like the largest blue light that we all evolved to, right? The sky. So first thing in the day, getting blue light exposure actually helps set your circadian cycle. But the more time that you spend, like, oh, that's a good staring at the sun, it's cool, right? Yeah. So like the blue light keeps you awake because your body got programmed like daytime awakeness, blue light, and then you're staring at the monitor, which generates blue light, and it keeps you awake because blue light. Oh, it's like I heard the click in your brain from Brooklyn. And which is why, which is why cell phones like started developing like automated night mode at like certain times a day where it turns a little bit more yellow because they're kicking off the blue light. So you're like, oh, I'm sleepy, and even though I'm looking at my phone, yeah, shit. So to get back, you're to, smart. Uh God damn it. I, I used my brain and then I made words with my mouth hole. God damn it. No. Uh, so anyway, uh, to get back to this dude's question. Um, so as, as fluffy sounding as it comes off as and like as much as it sounds like some Instagram la la coach, um, creating a sleep ritual is actually very important because you're trying to like hack your neuro programming of like, okay, it's time for this now. Um, and so you make it a stack of things just like you would with a little kid. So like the way the little kid knows it's time to go to bed is it's like, okay, Timmy, it's seven 30. We're gonna like take a tubby and take then a bath, brush your read teeth. a book. And then I'm going to read you this book and then I'm going to kiss you on the forehead and now it's eyes closed, right? And and what you're doing is creating a cascade of triggers so that like these are the ways that we program to sleep. Um, adults are not different. <laughs> we want to think we are, but we're not. So how can you create a stack cascade that's like, okay, I, I at this time I shut the screens off and then I do this and I do this and I do this and I do this. Um, and so some of the things that we know are helpful your body temperature naturally drops as you fall asleep. So you can hack the temperature drop off effect by taking a hot shower. Um, because as you cool off, the temperature drop will help you feel drowsy. Um, it's also warm beverages. So non-stimulating warm beverages. Uh, hot I've cup of coffee right before bed. <laughs> yeah, take a hot cup of coffee right um, and I'm sure some people are going to put in chat like, caffeine doesn't affect me. Well, that has to do with your liver enzymes. And I will tell you that the Marshall liver enzymes, it does affect us very aggressively. <laughs> Unless you take Adderall every day, in which case caffeine doesn't do fuck all. But that's a different issue. I have chosen to use my to, to deal with my attention issues differently than you have. Yes. Yeah. I have chosen meditation and exercise instead if I, of... If I meditated, I'd start snoring. <laughs> Because I need to get more sleep regularly, but anyway. So that so well, but this is this is like the third time today I'm going to say this because I led a guided meditation online earlier today. Um, if you fall asleep while you're meditating, it's because you needed hmm. to sleep. Oh, and speaking of which, um, guided meditation. We should probably mention that you do those on the old interwebs now. Oh yeah, so my personal way of dealing with self isolation and feeling useless in this weird moment is that uh, I'm leading guided meditation uh, every day at noon until I get to go back to work or like there's work to even do. Cause when you work with sick people and there's a pandemic virus, you don't get to go to work because they can't show up. True. Um, <clears throat> so 
uh, tomorrow at noon Eastern time. Um, if some, if anyone would like the zoom invite, I can drop it into chat. Um, but you can also find me on Instagram. That's the other way I'm doing it through both platforms. So people who aren't on Instagram can still do it. I don't know if maybe we can pipe it into the, the stream if you want, Dan. You can, you um, can punch it right into discord whenever it is that you're going to do it. Like, you know, 10 minutes before or something, we'll just oh, make sure. a post. That's cool. So if you guys um, are in the discord, it'll, there'll be a post about it. And if you guys can do that tomorrow, if you want to. And it's so the type of meditation, it's a progressive relaxation meditation, and it's in the scientific literature show to actually Im decrease systemic inflammation, which means it improves the efficacy of your um, immune system. It lowers blood pressure and anxiety. It contributes depression um so it's a it's a skill that can be massively effective right now if you believe in those things and you're willing to try it um so i will put it into discord tomorrow before we do it um so yeah we talked about sleep drive we talked about circadian cycle we talked about ritual and biphasic sleep uh let's pin on melatonin because it came up melatonin is a hormone that your body will produce in the volume that you need it and i personally think that taking a melatonin supplement most people do not take it far enough in advance of when they need to drop off and your body is making it as well so again i'm not a clinician so i don't like did i just disappear nope you're good keep going, keep going. <clears throat> um sorry so if you are working with a sleep psychologist uh or a sleep specialist do what they say this is like a sleep coach isn't going to tell you to take melatonin uh and that's what i been trained in sleep coaching. Um, what we do typically use melatonin for is time zone shift changes or shift work, because you can use melatonin to induce a change to your circadian cycle. So if you're changing time zone or you're changing your sleep clock, that's when you can use melatonin to like force it to hit the reset button. Um, but supplementing uh, melatonin on the regs isn't actually helpful to like your system, in my professional opinion, as a person who's been trained as a sleep coach. Meh. So, so uh, to summarize, the idea would be like melatonin should be used sparingly, if at all. Focus more on uh, like like um, consistency, rhythm, ritual. Um, yeah. What you're telling yourself. And, um, and don't and don't overstress about like your inability to sleep, I guess would be if you can like work on ways to try and keep yourself calm down rather than stress about your inability to sleep. Yeah. Well, one of the weird things about sleep as a phenomenon is like all of our other drives are not also psychological phenomenon, right? Like if I'm thirsty, I'm just thirsty. Uh, I can't talk myself out of needing water to function. I can overstimulate myself. And, and okay. So think about it this way. When, we were evolving as a species. If you were tired, you would sleep. And the only time you wouldn't sleep is if there was either a threat or like fun times, wink, nudge. So it, it, both of those processes to keep you awake, to override your sleep drive means having enough adrenaline that it shuts down the hormone cascade that like brings you to sleep. So you have to be stimulated enough to keep your adrenals on so that you can't sleep. So if you are sleepy and you're like, no, I have to finish this episode of CSI, I'm going to stay up. The way that you're staying up is like pumping your adrenal hormones. Um, your brain and your physiology don't have any way to know 20 minutes later when you're like, ah, that was a great resolution to that can television show. Uh, shut it off, go to bed. Now it's bedtime. It's like, but no, you, you, you gave me adrenaline. Like you gave me a stimulants internally. I, I, is the threat actually over? And the ritual is like the priming that like, and now the threat is done. And I'm going to walk through these steps of like, I do this and I do this and I do this and now I sleep. Um, but when you're sleepy, you should go to sleep. And like that dip in uh, stimulating hormone, when that happens, like ride the dip and go to bed at that point. Don't be like, no, I'm not tired. I need to do shit. Um, you know, like most of the time, ride the wave. It's okay if you're occasionally breaking the cycle because it's meant to reset regularly, but like, yeah, ride the wave. Cool. 
There you go. All right. Do you guys have uh you guys have any other questions, things that you would like to know? Stuff that you want to discuss? We got about uh five or so minutes left. We've been been, been here almost two hours, I believe that. Yeah, this has been a minute. Yeah. I, my, my phone keeps blowing up. Um, should we plug the thing? Should I talk about the things? Yeah, the let's. Website? I can pull up. Uh, so it's been a chat command in uh, in the chat the whole time here um, for people that wanted to see it or know about it. Um, but here, I'll pull up the uh, the website. Uh, so if you go to darlene.coach slash one peg, uh, she, she generated this really, really cool site about figuring some shit out for you shitters. Um, but the idea is, is that, uh, all the stuff that we were talking about today is all conceptual, right? The idea being that, um, uh, those concepts in, in whole, uh, if those are things that you find to be relatively problematic with yourselves, uh, Darlene is obviously, uh, somebody that practices teaching other people the mechanisms by which to work on fixing that shit. So, um, she has a couple of different levels here. One is uh, one that's designed for personal, uh, like one-on-one -on -one coaching, like you talk with her on a regular basis and she develops stuff for you specifically. Uh, that is extremely limited in, in scope and size. Uh, I think she has, what, five spots. Um, and then there's something else that is um, uh, that is done for for you guys uh, at, a, at a very, very steep uh, discount. Um, that has to do with like lesson plans and coaching and, and, uh, and, you know, reading the stuff that you can do kind of on your own, um, you know, lists of books and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so it's not, it's not like one-on-one -on -one coaching kind of things. Uh, but it's, it's stuff that you guys can, uh, can take advantage of if you want to like, you know, help yourselves out, uh, in a manner of speaking. Um, so uh, if you want to check that out, like I said, it's just Coach Dar in in uh, in chat. Um, I don't know if you have anything that you want to add to that. Yeah, that's. It. I mean, you you thank you. You great <laughs> way to stump for me, Dan. Um, Do what I can. Yeah, it's essentially that I. Yes, yeah, I think yeah, coaching is really effective, but I know that not everyone can afford coaching. Um, and at the moment, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, I'm a full-time master student in addition to like having my debt, my jobby job. Um, so I, I'm limited in how many clients I can work with, but I also wanted to make the information available. So it really is like, I normally don't share my worksheets outside of my coaching sessions, but so I bundled up like here, here's my teaching plans. Here's my, my worksheets. This is how do you use these things for yourself and, you know, some other materials that could be helpful. Um, yeah. Your, you there mean you your, your real job? My, I said jobby job because my real job is like I still own my own business and I make my own hours. And my job is spending an hour at a time helping people like take better care of themselves. So it's this on a micro scale. So my, my jobby job is not necessarily like. Oh, so you have two, you have two real jobs. <laughs> Oh, it's all bullshit anyway. It's all social construct. Don't you guys know that? <laughs> it's all social construct. So Pink Assassin is asking a question about uh, stance on theory of telling yourself you got enough sleep and the positive outcomes of it versus telling yourself you got shitty night's sleep and being more of a downer kind of person related to that line of thought. So kind of like self-deprecating. Yeah. So, I mean, look, some days you're not going to feel good, but... We placebo effect is still in effect. So the thing that you tell yourself matters in framing. So I can either be like, well, today will be fine even if I slept like shit. And, and that has a very different effect in terms of cascade of how your day goes than just over and over being like, I slept like shit and today's going to suck. I slept like shit and today's going to suck. Um, either one is a frame of how you're going to look at the world that day. And all of us learned our frames growing up one way or another. And I believe very strongly that you can choose to work on your framing. So like today's going to be awesome. Even if I had a bad night or today's going to suck even, you know, because I had a bad night, either one is going to affect you, right? Like either one is making massive assumptions about your day. So 
recognizing that it's a choice, right? Like meaning making is a choice. And you can cause things to mean whatever you want them to mean. I don't have research on this specific like framing. I don't, I don't know for a fact that telling myself it's going to be better will make it better, but telling myself it will be worse will make me a crabby bee all day. So nobody wants that. Nobody wants that coach. <laughs> like, like it doesn't help. Does that help? <laughs> that, I mean, I, I felt assisted. <laughs> oh, great. Anything I can do to, to, to the sis assist. That's right. That's right. But so, uh, so people, uh, somebody, somebody said that the, uh, the moniker given this is now Brodar. That's who I am. Apparently Brodar. You're, you're, oh, oh man. Yeah. Dark, dark bro. Yeah. It's fine. Oh, I'm sorry. That's fine. Cis oh, peg, I'm glad six, that helped. Cis peg and Brodar. Um, all right. So, uh, in closing, anything else that you want to, you want to say? Um, thank you for listening to my mouth make words for almost two hours. I hope that anyone was helped at all with this. Um, if you are into some of what I'm about and working on and you're into Instagram, please join me over there at darlene.coach. Um, if you have more personal specific questions that you didn't want to drop into chat, my email address is darlene at darlene.coach. Um, I'm hosting daily meditations at noon until this mess is more better. I also teach webinars for teams and groups on self-care and sleep and communication. Um, so if you're working remotely and your team is feeling a bit spread out, um, let's talk because I can help them humanize one another. And yeah, if you're, if you're into this, this is what I'm trying to bring into the world. And Dan is trying to help me figure out how to do that. So I appreciate you guys joining us for this experiment because he's much better at putting things onto the internet than me. And um, we're working on it. <clears throat> yeah. So uh, she's, uh, so Dar is, is kind of venturing into the, uh, into the world of like streaming and, and this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, we're going to, we'll, we'll do this more regularly um, for sure. It'll be, uh, it'll oh. be fun. I didn't plug the podcast. Um, so I yeah. just launched a podcast a few weeks ago called Better Than Fine. Um, it's not up on the Apple podcasting yet, but it's on Spotify and it's through Anchor. So you can find it through almost every other platform. Um, but basically it's everything we just talked about is the foundation of this. It's that, you know, traditionally we talk about psychology being like how broken people are and that positive psychology is the examination of like what it's like to not just settle for okay. And I don't think okay is a high enough bar that we as a society, like we, it's all a social construct. Like we can make it whatever we want it to be. And what we've built is messing people up. Right. So like, let's use what we can figure out, human ingenuity, um, problem solving, science, um, caring and giving a crap about each other. Uh, and so the podcast is better than fine. And thank you for showing up if if you do and um i hope that this has been helpful for anybody yeah so um if you guys have anything that you want to write her message on uh you can either email her like she said uh you can also send her uh, a direct message through discord because she has discord now i'm just figuring that part out yeah so, be so, patient with so you can <laughs> you can message her on there and i'm you know i'm sure that she'll see it um at some point I'll figure it out. Yeah. But yeah, if you'll have let let Dan and she's, know. She's a, v, she's a VIP. She's a VIP. She's a Yeah, she's a she's a VIP um in the in the channel, so you can find her like right on the user list, you know, or or uh, it's it's just Coach Dar in uh, in Discord, so you can send her yeah, a message. Coach there. Dar in Discord. If um if you liked this and you want me to come back, tell tell Peg. Yeah. No, what we're, we're gonna do? I don't care if they like it or not. We're gonna do it again. So. <laughs>